Uh, welcome back. So our first speaker is Julio and he'll talk about harmonic functions and Poisson boundary. Okay, thanks. Thanks again for the invitation and thanks for still being here after one week and a half of conference, so very nice. Okay, so today um, we'll go to the next topic. So yesterday we talked about uh, singularity of harmonic measures and various properties of random walks and hyperbolic spaces or hyperbolic groups. And uh, I will come back to the proof of the theorem that I announced yesterday in the last lecture. But in the next two lectures, we will discuss another uh, object that is relevant to the theory, which is the Poisson boundary. And I will claim, um, I will uh, announce the result and tomorrow I will give the proof. So the theory of Poisson boundary starts once again with a beautiful theory of harmonic functions on the circle. So, so this is a classical Poisson representation formula that you probably have seen in complex analysis. So what does the Poisson representation formula say? Well, if you're in the disk, you can look at harmonic functions in the disk. So when I talk about harmonic functions, I mean in the analytic sense, so just a so function from the disk to R, which is bounded and whose Laplacian is zero. Okay, so, and we know from, again, from classical complex analysis, for instance, that there is a duality, there is a, a um, bijection between two types of functions. So one are the harmonic functions inside the disk, they said, and the other is bounded measurable functions, so L infinity functions on the boundary of the disk, which is S1. And again, the measure here, the reference measure would just be the Lebesgue measure. And so there is such a projection. And you probably remember how, how to go from one side to the next. So for instance, if you have, so how do we go from this way? So we have a function uh, which is defined inside the disk. And how do we get a function on the boundary from, from, from this? Yeah, in this case, you can just take limits. For instance, radial limits would work. So this is taking, let's say radial limits. So for instance, if you, if you have, you can define F of Xi where Xi is a boundary point as a limit of Phi. So if Phi will be a function inside of R Xi, where Xi goes to one. So we have Phi in here and then, we have here. okay. And then we have another direction. What would, what would the other direction be? Well, the other direction is if you have a function on the boundary, how do you get a harmonic function inside? Yeah, so they, this way usually is expressed as a convolution with a Poisson kernel. And personally, I am not really a 100% of an analyst, maybe, I don't know, so some positive measure of it. So. I, I, when I see this formula, I, 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 I'm like, what, what, what is going on? So let's, let's recall what is the formula. So again, if, if F is in L1 of S1, then the formula is the following. So U of R e to the I theta is the integral between minus pi to pi of f of e to the i t, and then we take this convolution with this bizarre function, the Poisson kernel, prt theta. And where prt, theta, PRT is this Poisson kernel, which if you want to write explicitly, it's different. Right, and so then, then satisfies that is harmonic. So, 
So this is all, all nice, but uh, what is actually very enlightening is to realize that this bizarre form in which you write the Poisson kernel, in fact, is very, very closely connected with the geometry of SL2R, actually, which acts, of course, as we know, we act by isometries on the disk. And so in the end, we can write a purely group theoretic version of this formula, which eventually would be the one that we want to generalize when we pass from this continuous version to the discrete version, which will be the one used for random walks and groups. And so let's, let's do this exercise. So, okay, so what do we want to find? We want to find the function in some point r e to the i theta. So, so if you write a as r e to the i theta, well, you, you, you pick g on, uh, in automorphisms of the disk such that g maps zero to a. So for instance, one such thing would be g of z, a minus z divided by one minus a bar z, so familiar formula. And then it turns out that what happens if we, if we look at the derivative of this action on the circle. So this is of course an automorph of the disk, but also acts on the circle. And so let's, let's do the computation. So if you look at the point z on the circle, so point e to the it, so this is in S1, well, we can do the computation. You take g prime of z. You do the computation, you get that this is one minus norm of a squared minus one minus a bar z norm square. So it's just a usual derivative. And so we can, and then we can think about how we wrote r e to the i theta is a and z is e to the i t. And so we can write that g prime e to the i t is nothing else than one minus r squared, this is the modulus of a, divided by one minus r e to the i t minus theta squared. Okay, so this starts to looking closer and closer to the Poisson kernel. In fact, it's, a, it's the same if you, if you, uh, you know, if you develop the um, square as a complex number, so this is exactly PR of P minus. And so, so how do we rewrite the formula? So the Poisson representation formula in a way that it's much harder to forget is the following. So you, you remember that we had this u r e to the i theta. So we can write it like this, it's the integral of f e to the i t. And then the Poisson kernel is nothing else, as we said, it's basically just the derivative of the action of g on the circle. So this is g prime e to the i t. And then we have, okay, we normalize, so we put the one over two pi here. So we get a probability measure circle, that's nice. And so basically what, what happens is we have this measure, which is the Lebesgue measure of the circle, and we just push it forward by this action by an element of SL2. And so this, again, can be rewritten in the end as the following, f of psi, so this is on the boundary of the disk of, this is the derivative, the, which we can even write as you know, radon nicotine derivative of, uh, of the, with respect to the Lebesgue measure, just the usual derivative. This is a holomorphic uh, map, so it's conforma, so you just take the norm, and then this is just the Lebesgue measure. And then, of course, one more change of variable, you just get the following f psi d g. Lambda of psi. So you see, you want to know, you want to know what is the value of this harmonic extension at a point, so this remember is A, which was G of zero. 
at a point inside the disk. You take an element that brings the origin to that point. And on, on the other side, you look at the action on the boundary. And you look at the push forward of the Lebesgue measure under this action. And this precisely gives you the harmonic extension. So you see, now we really don't need analysis anymore, so to speak, because we have this group action and we have a measure on the boundary. And that's pretty much is all we need to carry on this, this theory of Poisson representation. OK, and so now the next question, of course, is what happens for discrete groups? Discrete groups, countable groups. So instead of having the whole SL2R group of symmetry, what if you have just a subgroup? Right. OK, and so that, that brings us to new definition, which is definition of harmonic function in this, uh, so again, so in this setting, we will have let G mu, let's say a measured group, meaning that meaning that G is discrete group and mu is a probability measure on it. And then we, we can define a notion of harmonic with respect to this measure. So function on the group F from G to R, is harmonic or with respect to mu, so mu harmonic. If, well, it satisfies a sort of mean value property because we don't have the Laplacian anymore in the discrete setting, or maybe there is some version of it, but we just use this other definition of harmonic function satisfies the mean value property. So f of g, if you want to look at the function in a element g, what do you do? Well, you take the value of the function in the neighboring elements. So we do um, GH. So, so we go from G to GH to the next neighboring uh, vertex, so to speak, and we average with the probability which is given by. Okay, so this is a nice notion that you can study on groups and you can ask what, it, what does it tell us about uh, the geometry, the algebra and whatnot of groups. Okay, and in fact, uh, we can look at various examples. So, so let's look at examples of harmonic functions. So if you take G to be the group Z, and then you take mu to be the usual balance measure between plus one and minus one, well, then it's pretty easy to tell what harmonic functions are. By the way, we need to introduce this definition, maybe right here. So we notation we call, H infinity of G mu would be the space of mu harmonic bounded functions. Okay. And so, right. So if you have a function that is harmonic with respect to this, so, well, it has to satisfy the following recursion. You have to say that F of N is one half of f of n plus one plus f of n minus one. So that's the recursion. And so how many functions are there? What are the functions that are of this form? Anyone has a guess? That's exactly right. So this is a recursion of two terms. So I mean, it, I mean one term in, in terms of two. So if you fix two points, everything is, it's well designed. So first of all, constant functions are always there. Uh, but then it turns out that, okay, you can rather write, write this as f of n plus one minus f of n equals f of n minus f of n minus one for any n. So basically uh, from the step n to the step n plus one, there's a fixed, uh, fixed uh, um, delta. So let's call this number uh, A, okay, and so how do we 
how do we get? So we get that f of n minus f of zero would be n times this b times a, sorry. And so f of n is of the form n times a plus b, where of course we set b equals f of zero. So these are just affine functions. So in general, if we don't say anything, so we just write h to not say the boundedness, in this case is f of n, just an affine function. Uh, see. Sorry, a and b are any reals. Have a vector space of dimension two. So, and of course, if you want to study the bounded ones, for instance, well, you can see immediately that if n is positive or negative, there is no bounded ones except for the constants. So the only bounded ones are the constants. So in this case, there are not very nice, very rich harmonic functions. You just have the more or less trivial ones. Also, we can do a slight generalization of this. If we consider the biased walk, so biased measure, always on the line. So the second example would be if you like g to be z, but then you take mu to be the following. So we take mu to be, you go to minus one with probability one over q plus one, and then we go to plus one with probability q over q plus one, for instance. So this is still, you know, a walk on the line, but depending, it becomes more balanced. For instance, it's more likely to go to plus one. So this, this type of function actually has a nice solution, which is not constant. Who can guess what the solution is? So right, so what is the, the equation here? So the equation is that f of n has to be f, yeah, one over q plus one, f of n minus one plus q over q plus one, f of n plus one. Anyone wants to guess? Yeah, yeah, we can find the solution. Yes, yes, yes. So what's the guess? They said the solution is very, very explicit in this case. Okay, so let me tell you, this is an exercise that you go and do at home. So the f of n equals q to the minus n in this case would be, is mu harmonic. So in this case, well, in this case, you can see something interesting that, okay, unfortunately, this function still is unbounded. Because of course, if n is positive, this is small, but if n is negative, this is large. So, but it's, there is an interesting positive one. So, okay, so basically you can figure out that hg of mu is of the form, um, yeah, a times q minus n plus b, where a and b are in r. And so h infinity, unfortunately, still is, is just r. But something interesting happens if you look at the positive ones, because then you can have any a positive and any b positive, and this gives you somehow two independent solutions. Okay, so, so this is, um, yeah, this is very nice. And however, still we haven't found any non-trivial function. So maybe all harmonic functions are constant and that's it. So. However, there are examples indeed, and we can, we can somehow use this example to our advantage. So the fact that I choose Q and Q plus one here, maybe we should give you a hint to what comes next. So if you take a free group, so if G is a free group and we look at, we want to, we want to X the Cayley graph 
of this to be the standard generator to be a tree on q plus one q plus one regular tree so clearly okay so you know the 2k has to be q plus one okay and then and then we do the simple random walk on this tree. so the measure is uniform so so what does the tree look like of course we've drawn similar tree before so let's do the case where q equals three as we are most used to so let's draw it like this there's another part here Okay, and so okay. So if you want to label the elements for from elements of the free group, okay, this would be the identity. This would be A. This would be A inverse. This would be B. This would be B inverse, and so forth. This is A squared, A B, A B inverse, and so forth. But anyways, so what we care most about is just the structure as a tree. Okay, so what is interesting here? is that if we if we cut the tree so if we if we just sort of so to speak cut the tree let's just look at the right part so let's just look at every every group element that starts with a okay so this is a tree but uh, it has a you know root and so from this root we can we can propagate the function whatever if we have a function defined on these two Things you can propagate the function, and so now we can be inspired by this example and check the following. Okay, so suppose that we give a weight one here, and then we get give weight q minus one here, and then q minus one here, and then q minus one here, and then q here. You could see that these things average out, right? Because you have q times, yeah, q times q minus one on this side, plus one divided by q minus one. So you get q, q plus one, you get this. So you see that if you don't care about the, of course, you, you could propagate this solution to the left, but then it would become unbounded. And so we would not be very happy. But right, so here we could q minus one, q minus two, q minus two, q minus two, and so forth. So this is a perfectly good solution. And it's a good solution if you go to the right-hand side because it's bounded. But if we go to the left-hand side, well, we, we would have to continue to make it unbounded and that's not so nice. Okay, so by the way, so what is, let me tell you precisely, yeah, what is the recipe? So we start, we know that on the cylinder of A, so everything starting with A, we have F of G equals Q to the minus G, norm of G plus one. So this is, is okay. Okay, we could also put the same type of function. Okay, we forget about this and we put it on the left. Well, of course, uh, you can do you can do the same. So how do we do the same? Well, it's the same thing. So instead of putting Q, we put one here, we put Q here, then we put Q inverse here, and so forth. Q inverse, and then Q minus two, Q minus two, and so forth. So clearly, the same thing applies. Uh -huh. Okay. And so this one would be on F minus C A. This would be F of G equals Q to the minus norm of G. Okay, now we, we need to glue these two solutions together. So how do we glue these solutions together? Well, we're lucky because this is a tree. So it has only this cut point. And so the other thing we, we know is that the space of harmonic functions here is a two-dimensional vector space. You have two parameters. 
So we can play with these two parameters and make these two, two sides match. So how do we do that? Well, we remark that on the left-hand side, if you not, you don't just, you could take this, but you could take A, some real parameter plus B, this would also be harmonic because we just added constant functions. Okay, so now let's, let's, uh, let's draw what would happen. So this one, instead of Q, you would have A, Q inverse plus B, this would be A, Q minus two plus B, and so forth. So this would be A times one plus B. <laughs> this is A times Q minus one plus B, and so forth. Okay. And this Q will become A times Q plus B, right? So, so on the, now we produce to so this yellow is still a solution on the left hand side. Okay, so, so, in order, so in order for two functions to match, to, to match, what do you need to check? Well, you just need to check of these two points. So you need to check that AQ plus B is one. I'll check in on this side. So this would be S of A. Okay, A, okay, unfortunate notation. <laughs> and now F on the identity, well, it's A times one plus B, and it's also Q. So once we set these two equations, again, you have two parameters, the two equations, so reasonably there should be a solution. Well, we can maybe even, even do the solution. So hopefully the computation was correct. So B would be one minus AQ would be A minus Q. Sorry, it would be Q minus A, right? So one, plus A equals, let's see, uh, right, so, okay, so one plus A, yeah, right, so it's Q, yeah, yeah, that's right, it's Q, right, <laughs> okay, okay, that's right, the one plus A is, Right. One plus A is Q times one plus A. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so this is only true if one plus A equals zero. Okay. So A equals minus one. And then, yeah, then we can take the other one. So B is Q minus A. So it's Q plus one. So in the end, the solution is the following. F of G is indeed Q to the minus G plus one on C of A, and then is Q plus one, this constant term minus, so this one is flipped, Q to the minus G on free group minus G of A. So here we really explicitly produce such a thing. Of course, uh, talked about amenability, Ponzi schemes and stuff, so. There is some relation here, of course. But anyways, for, for the free group, as, as the theme of the whole workshop would be that the free group and, and an amenable group are different, and indeed uh, they are even from this point of view. So the good news, again, is indeed that H infinity of the free group with respect to this uh, simple random walk is indeed bigger than just one. And in fact, uh, it, it's, it's gonna be much, much bigger. <laughs> in fact. Yeah, so in a sense here, we're taking one direction in the tree and then it turns out that you could take any direction in the tree and get Anna. So this will come up later. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so now we, we get into the slightly more technical part of the actual definition of the Poisson boundary, which is 
a space on which you can perform this Poisson representation formula. So again, yeah, again, we start with the measured group, G mu. And so now what is the boundary? So, well, first of all, whatever the boundary is, the group has to act on the boundary. So let be space on which G acts. Well, in fact, it would be enough that it acts measurably, but usually we will always be by homeomorphisms. So let's, let's require that. And then what's, what's the first definition that we say? We want to say, uh, what is a mu boundary? So a G space, B, is a mu boundary if the following is true, if there is a map yeah, G equivariant map P, I'm oh, sorry, pi, from where? Well, pi is from the space of um, the, path spa the path space of the random walk. So this is the space of infinite sequences with so this, remember, this is the path space to be. And this map has to be invariant by shift in the form, so such that pi Composed with T equals pi. So what is T here? So T is the shift where T is a time shift. And on, on omega and the following, so that's the following. So if you start from a random walk and you look at the locations of the random walk, then it gives you W n plus one. So you, you, you just sort of formally, you, you have your walk and you forget, yeah, you forget about the first step and you start at the second step. So this is not, not the shift in the space of increments. This is a different shift. So this is a shift in the space of locations of the run. So this seems like a bizarre definition but uh, we already saw an example of that, which in fact will be our main example. So our main example is that if, right, so let's say G, G acts on, on X of delta hyperbolic, for instance, hyperbolic space. Okay, so we can take B, the Gromov boundary, And again, we have new non-elementary, so we know that the random walk will converge almost surely. And so then we define what? We define, we need to define this map pi, which maps what? Which maps a sequence Wn, well, to what? To a point in the boundary. Well, what, what would you think it is? Well, it's the limit point. So we define it, the map, which maps the space to the limit point of Wn. Okay, we take O base point. In fact, the base point doesn't matter in the sense. It turns out that if you change O with O prime, in fact, the, the limit point is the same. So it doesn't really matter. So this one, this limit point we showed that is in boundary of X almost surely. So this is a measurable theory, much like Amil was talking about. So all these maps are measurable map, so you can remove sets of measure zero in some sense. Okay, so clearly, clearly this map is invariant under shift because, well, if you, if you forget the first step of the random walk, the limit is the same. So this will be the most important case for such map. Yes? Yeah, 
Yeah, the shift and the G action are not the same. Yeah, that's they're sort of complementary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. G moves the walk, and T changes the type. So yes, of course, so they, there is a relation because yeah, it's the same group. Yeah, that's right. And then, okay, once you have that, we define we define a measure. Once you have that, and the measure associated to this, the harmonic measure would be just the push forward under this projection map of the measure on the space of paths. So once you have such thing, you would have a measure also on the space. In fact, you can, uh, you can look at the lemma that will tell you that indeed nu is mu, uh, yeah, is mu harmonic as a measure. Yeah, so we start with this shift on this measure here. And then when you project it down again, because of the interplay between the action and the shift, the measure that you get is mu harmonic. So this is an easy exercise, except it's an exercise about thinking about things in the right way. So let, let me, in fact, let me, let me phrase this in, the, in terms of this map, which is easier to, to interpret. So, so recall that, okay, nu is pi star p, and also we have that pi composed with t equals pi. Okay, so clearly, so nu of a is by definition pi star p of a, but this by this is also pi star t star p of a. This is by this. Okay, and now we have to wrap our head around what it means to, to do this push, push forward. Well, if you do pi, this is just uh, the boundary map. So this is just t star of p of the set such that the limit of the sample path lies in A. So this is the pi, bring the pi. But now, what, what does it mean to do the shift in the space of paths? Well, we just look at the next step of the run walk. There's just the probability that the limit starting at the next step will belong to the set. And now, what, what's, what's, uh, what changes from the original situation? Well, here we haven't specified the first step. So the first step is free to be chosen. And then once you specify the first step, then the, the other steps are, are clear. So if you sort of condition on the first step, so you can choose the first step, mu of G. So this would be first step. Okay, and then what happens? Well, yeah, it turns out that, so the, you have to put the first step there. And so, this becomes the probability that the limit as n of a random walk, which is like that, it starts with g, which is chosen as first step. And then from there on, you, you have a still a random walk. And so the, by the Markov property is equivalent to, to putting again, n step of a random walk. So you can write it again, Wn or maybe Wn tilde is a different Walker principle, but it has the same law <laughs> as before. So we just re-indexed. Okay, and so from here then it's it's pretty clear. You can look at the group action. So you see the group action is indeed needed. So far we use the shift. Now if we use the group action, well, we see that this is mu of g times what? Well. Right, this is indeed the probability that the limit Wn tilde, this new walk, belongs to G inverse of A by the group, group action. And so, well, this is by definition, basically, so this is G mu G, this is by definition the hidden measure of G inverse of A, and then by definition of push forward, this is indeed mu of G 
G star mu. Uh, G star mu of A. Now this is a, like an exercise to about looking, understanding the shift map in this group action, but basically that's, that's okay. So now we have a measure on the space and whenever we have a boundary, geometric boundary, so we have such a, such a. So now the Poisson boundary is, yes. From that space limit w and o, but yeah, but it's supposed to belong to the Zoma bound. Yeah, so there's some statement like almost every random walk. Yeah, yeah, this is contained in the, my previous what I talked about in the, for for instance in the paper with Mara, but okay, it's it depends on the context. Is no without any assumption except the non-elementarity. So that is <laughs> not small assumption, but still, yeah. Okay, so, right, so now we are ready to define, so the analog, so remember that, okay, so let, so remember that we had this picture, we had this picture of H infinity of D, which is dual to L infinity of S1, the Lebesgue measure. Right, and so remember that on, on the one hand we did we did uh, this is the radial limit, and this would be convolution. So first of all, let me tell you that so the radial limit. So here there seems to be no probability, but there is probability, because again, what is the radial limit? Okay, we can take the radial limit. This is one option. So we have phi defined here, and then you look at. F by taking ray, but as a probabilist, you can use your friend Brownian motion. So again, there's a Brownian motion here. So instead of looking at the limit along the ray, you could take a random path and you look at the limit along the random. Path. And I mean, so, and by harmonicity in a martingale convergence theorem, we might see it in the discrete case. You you get convergence. And so almost surely you can define. The other one is this convolution. So, okay. So this one, so the radial limit will be replaced by, in the discrete setting, will be replaced by, um, uh, right, random limit of random paths. And then the convolution would be replaced by this group action, so which we will we call the Poisson transform. And this is, this is more or less what we did for the classical one. And in general, you can define the same object to this, whenever you have a group action on the boundary type object. Okay, so, so that is the Poisson transform. Well, some transform is this operation. Is this map phi, big phi operator, between L infinity of the boundary with this measure, stationary measure that we produce there, into harmonic functions on the group. So again, this tells you how to sort of extend the function inside. And how do you do it? Well, it's so simple, it seems bizarre. So f would be a function on the boundary, okay? And we want to evaluate it at the point g in the group. And so how do we do it? We take f, we take nu, we push forwards nu by g, and we take the integral, that's it. So that's uh, that's just it. So this is literally what we did before. Okay. So an interesting other exercise that we can do, and so I think we have actually some time, fortunately, is that we can um, we can check that phi of f indeed is mu harmonic because 
It might not seem so trivial. In fact, it is the case. So, so what do you do? So you do phi of f of, uh, right? So you have phi of f of gh. Yeah, you want to say something like this. You want to take an average of that times new h. Right? This is, and the question is whether this is phi f of g. Okay, and so, okay, so we can write it, actually, sorry, let, let me, right, okay, so we can rewrite this as following. So, so what is this? So this is, you can think of the integral over g, which is the sum, the integral over b, which is coming from here, of f of, G H psi D nu psi. So this is the, the Poisson transform computed at G H and D mu H. I write D mu H because it's easier to exchange the integrals if you write them in the same way, even though it's okay. And now we, we have to realize what, what exactly are we doing here? Well, we're looking at a convolution of these two measures. So let me, so let me write it down. And this is the same as f of g y d mu star nu y. So we're like taking a change of variables y equals h psi. So y would be a point on the boundary, and yeah, so so you have a so you have a convolution operator between measures, so mu, right? So what is the convolution operator? Well, yeah, if you have a g times b in g in uh, right in b, so this is the action, and then uh, yeah, so the push bar, bar, yeah, so here we have mu mu tensor nu. You push it forward, this new measure, you call it mu. And it's the same definition as, as, as for the harmonic measure, but yeah, you can. So, and the thing about the harmonic measure is that, so mu is harmonic, new, sorry, new is harmonic. Can be just rewritten by saying that mu star new equals new. So this operator just averaging over all translates. And so, so since new is harmonic, well, then we get integral of f of g y, and then we can replace mu star new by new, so this is d new of y. And that's literally it. So this is literally phi f of g. So again, this is, again, to be more uh, fluent with this language of group actions on measures, but uh, it's, it's basically formal. So this is the, in some sense, this is the greatness of Furstenberg's construction. Everything is very clean once you set things up nicely. Questions? Okay, so now we are ready to give the actual definition of a Poisson boundary. So the definition is that given, again, very importantly, we need always to be given G and mu, and sometimes in certain communities, people, you know, sometimes overlook this fact. This very much depends on mu, even though in the end it turns out that it will almost look like it doesn't in the practical cases that we know how to do it, but still does very much depend on this. So, given G mu, right, a, a mu boundary B nu is the Poisson boundary.
yeah, if the Poisson transform is bijective. So recall the Poisson transform is from infinity v nu into h infinity v nu is bijective. So means that you see every harmonic function on the group can be represented by a function on the boundary. So you, in particular, this, is, this, this boundary has to be large enough so that it can represent all possible harmonic functions. We will say a few more words about that. So of course, the immediate corollary is that, uh, so yeah, so the Poisson boundary, Poisson boundary is trivial, meaning is a point, is isomorphic to point, With atomic measure, if and only if every bounded harmonic functions is constant. So that's that's one way to detect the Liouville property. So if you can prove that heavy bounded harmonic function is constant, the Poisson boundary is trivial, or vice versa. So, the, so one very important remark is that, okay, I say the Poisson boundary, what does D mean here? So the uniqueness is, is very subtle. So B, so the Poisson boundary, so yeah, so the Poisson boundary is unique in which category as a uh, yeah measurable g space so so you have to remember so you can you can remove countably many points that's fine but you 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 have to transport the measure to the measure and as a me not measurable but measured at measure g space you 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 remember the measure and you remember the group action so sometimes you would see that different spaces act as Poisson boundary for the same uh, group. This is because the boundaries in question, they differ by a small set. So for instance, some sets of measures. Okay, so, um, so in particular, yeah, so let's see, let's see some uh, history of a number of cases that this, of course, has a very long history. Let's, but let's see a couple of very, very clear examples. So first of all, you see that there are no bounded harmonic functions. You could already guess on which groups there are no bounded harmonic functions, at least some of them. So the examples. So first of all, if G is abelian or nilpotent, Oh, by the way, even before that, the finite groups that no one likes. So uh, the Poisson boundary is always trivial. And why? By the maximum principle, because the harmonic function has to have the maximum, cannot have a maximum anywhere unless it's constant. And for, on a finite set, it, it has to have a maximum. So, so that's it. But for infinite groups, so abelian and important then, yeah, then the Poisson boundary, I will say PB is trivial. And this is for any measure. Okay, we always assume that the measure is generating in the sense that the support of the measure generates the group as a semi group, but other than that, for every measure. And this, okay, is given by several people Blackwell. I think first, even if he didn't talk explicitly, but he, he started, started this, Choquet Denis, uh, Dink in Malutov independently, I think. By the way, the characterization of groups for which the Poisson boundary is trivial for every measure, well, this has been uh, carried to completion only recently, 
by two people like uh, Harman, Frisch, Tomutz, and Vahidi Ferdosi, I think. So this is not a trivial uh, <laughs> thing at all to tell which when it, this is trivial. Okay, now for let's go to Furstenberg's type of stuff. So if G is a semi-simple Lie group, okay, then for okay sufficiently nice meshes, the Poisson boundary is G mod P, where P is minimal. Parabolic element. Because in fact, the Poisson boundary is the maximal possible new boundary. So let me also remark the following proposition that the Poisson boundary is maximal in many, you can say it in many ways, but for instance, so every T invariant. G equivariant uh, map F from omega P into some other G space M lambda, yeah, factors through Poisson boundary, we call it BP, would be Poisson, new P, it's Poisson boundary, meaning that, okay, remember there's this canonical map from omega P to BP new p, and so every time you have a map out of the cat space, which is t invariant, by some universal property, these factors through, through this. So there exists some g. So in particular, the Poisson boundary is a very good space to construct maps out of it. And that's indeed one of the steps in the or super rigidity type of arguments. So, right. So in particular, it's the maximal one because if you take here any mu boundary, well, there's always a map from the Poisson boundary to that one, meaning that this is a quotient of this. There are many interpretations uh, where you can also see this maximality, but I think for today, we'll just mention this. And so it's natural that P is minimal because you want G mod P to be max. Now, G, yes, right. So, okay, so I think he, right. Right, I think he, he wanted rotationally invariant measures for the, at least he worked on this in this context. Now you could ask, and yeah. So I think originally he was looking at an actual, not a discrete measure, but he was ask, looking at a measure that is absolutely continuous with respect to the Haar measure. And it's rotationally invariant. And maybe still, I don't know if it's completely supported or not. This was the original first, but anyways. Yeah, so, so there are some geometric conditions in the measure. But okay, maybe maybe it could still be true in, in general. But so let's go to discrete groups. So, so if G is non-amenable, right? So in fact, G is non-amenable if and only if Poisson boundary is non-trivial for any measure. So yeah, this is. This is given by, yeah, this is uh, the Kamenovich Vershik. They, they, yeah, they prove the converse existence of at least one trivial measure on any amenable. Okay, but however, there are amenable groups. There are amenable groups and walks on them such that they're. Poisson boundary is not trivial. And so as Gabor said, the, the counter example everybody likes is lamplighter group. In this case, you can take lamplighter group, but it's not enough to take it over Z or Z square because the runner walk has to be transient on the base space. So, but for instance, if you do 
z cube is one such example. So in fact, there's a theorem that if you take a finite group with product a graph, then yeah, and yeah. So the random walk, if it's transient, then you get a non-trivial boundary. If it's recurrent, you get a trivial boundary. For say the simple measures, then there's more. If you allow yourself measures, more complicated measures, then then things get very interesting on non-particles. Yeah. Right, right. So you can replace this by any finite group. Uh, yeah, I think Kaimanovich and Vashik basically already give the idea. Yeah. Otherwise, there's a survey by Erschler that discusses all this ICM address of Erschler on this. Very good. Okay, so let me now state the theorem. So, okay, now what, what are our favorite groups? Okay, hyperbolic groups. So, so if G is hyperbolic, and then hyperbolic-like groups, okay, then for any mu with finite entropy, so I'll define the entropy and finite logarithmic moment. Yes. Yeah. The Poisson boundary is the Gromov boundary. Again, with the measure which is defined by taking the random walk and conversion. So, in fact, so what is the entropy? So, the entropy of a measure is minus mu of g log mu of g. So for the moment, we just need this to be finite, then there will be a dynamical version of this, which is more relevant, but let's say this is finite. And the finite logarithmic moment means that the, the integral of log distance on where you act, so for instance, on itself in this case, the average of that is infinite. Okay, so in this, so so this is due to Kaimanovich, 2000. And this is the famous strip criterion, which maybe Vadim talked about when he talked here last time. And <laughs> this is very, very well studied in 20 years. And from this, there are many, many generalizations of this to groups that are not quite hyperbolic, but they still act in hyperbolic spaces like mapping class group, out of fan, relatively hyperbolic groups and so forth. Yes? Correct. Convergence does not require any moment condition. Yes. Okay, so now we can go to our theorem, which is an improvement on this. So let me first state for hyperbolic groups, which is already definitely already new there. So theorem B, this was given last, last year by Ola, Orhani, Rish, and myself. So the following that for any finite entropy measure, on, yeah, on a non-elementary, so not Z, hyperbolic, not virtually Z group, G, so finite entropy measure mu, right? The space, boundary of G, so this is the Gromov boundary with the Hitton measure is the sun boundary. 
Okay, here, yeah, we, we can say, yeah, we can, if we want to really, really be precise, we can say generating measures, so to say that the support generated by mu as a semi-group is the whole group, just to make sure that, which is always the case in this basis. Okay, so this is just the chrome of boundary, and this is the heat image. So what's the fence, of course, so here are those two conditions. There's a finite entropy. The final log moment. So here we, we remove any moment condition of sorts, but yeah, we, we only use the and we do not use the strip criterion. We will see tomorrow what the proof is. So we use still entropy theory. So that's why the final entropy is very good. But we um, we remove any moment condition, but yeah, and so we have to give us somewhat uh, new criterion, bit uh, yeah more sophisticated version of this strip criterion basically okay and also okay we can look at other actions so there are many groups which are not hyperbolic but they act on hyperbolic metric spaces but okay we need at least a certain condition certain properness condition because we want to compare the geometry of the group to the geometry on the space on which it acts. And the condition is, which we need is this famous WPD condition of Besfin and Fujiwara. Which is in one, it's almost the weakest condition. I mean, okay, now there's even WWPD, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is the weakest the properness condition that I am familiar with in geometric group theory. So, uh, so if you if let e g you know acts by isometries on hyperbolic metric space again this this time it need not be uh, locally compact or proper. Okay then. Uh, Luxodromic. So we we start with the Luxodromic. G is WPD if so weakly this stands for weakly properly discontinuous if for every k constant k for every point in the space there exists some integer n such that the following is true so the joint stabilizer so I'm gonna write like that stub k of O intersect uh, Stub K of G and O. I will explain this notation. It's finite. What's the K stabilizer? K stabilizer is just a set of group elements such that the distance between O and its image under G is less than K. So, so this are uh, everything is coarse. This is coarse geometry. So. We, we can, we, we, what, what is the idea of this condition? Well, the idea of this condition is G is a loxodromic element. So G or G, yeah, we can take a power, but anyways, G is a loxodromic element. It has some axis. So if we take, I don't know, O and G and O on the axis, for instance, then we take another. So we want to say, okay, can we move? this axis of itself. So can we produce some H which moves this to here and also moves this to here? Is there some H which moves the axis sort of parallel to itself? But it sort of almost fixes these two far away points in this direction. And the WPD condition tells you that this is only achievable for finitely many choices of age. So this is a weak properness because it's a properness only in the direction of G. Okay, and so in fact, we can generalize this, this uh, result, which in fact, yeah, is already new even for the free group, but in fact, more or less the same proof goes through to all these hyperbolic-like actions as long as you have this WPD property. Okay, so the 
last theorem, which is proof is again very similar. It's the same group of people, same paper. So okay, so we turn with G on X acting. Not uh, yeah, yeah, acting on yeah on a delta hyperbolic space. Okay, mu a non-elementary measure so here. On G, and the support is such that yeah. Yeah, so the, the semi-group generated by the support by support of mu contains at least one loxodromic, uh, one, sorry. Loxodromic is already in here, contains at least the WPD element. And that's enough. And then uh, the finite entropy, of course. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah, with finite entropy, which is only about the group, it does not see the space, the entropy. Okay. So then the Poisson, the boundary, the Grom of boundary of the space with the heated measure is the Poisson boundary. Of this group. So clearly, if you're familiar with these types of actions, you, you know that there will be lots of applications. So let me just list a couple. And again, and tomorrow we will see the proof of this. So okay. So first interesting application, even if you don't care about geometric group theory, maybe. Even people in probability, maybe if X, if G is the free group of infinitely many generators, this has action on itself and turns out to be WPD. So at least there's, yeah, I think in this case, most elements are WPD. I forgot exactly. X is, K, X is the Cayley graph with a standard generating set. That will be one option. Of course, the boundary would be just the boundary of the tree here. Second is if you take G phi one of a hyperbolic manifolds, of course, M tilde here X is a universal cover and it has gram of boundary. And okay, this action is, is proper, it's, it's properly discontinuous. So you don't really need the infinite infiniteness of, of X, but, but the group need not be hyperbolic, of course. So. Okay, so then if you have a G relatively hyperbolic group, yes? No. It's, uh, the boundary is no longer compact. Correct, correct. <laughs> yes, but I didn't mention that. So in fact, the original theory of mu boundaries by Furstenberg wants the boundaries to be compact, but the Kaimanovich version of it just works in the measurable category. So you can talk about boundaries even if they're not compact. Yeah, no, that's definitely the case. Okay, so if G is a relative hyperbolic group, well, if you know a little bit of that, so X will be the cone of space, when you cone off the horribles, so in this case, this is the first example where this is non proper, but hyperbolic. So these were theorems before with a stronger assumption. So we remove basically this moment condition on all this literature. This one, I, don't, I didn't see it in the literature, but okay. Probably something on this. Okay, well, this one basically is the same proof as classical Kaimanovich proof. Yeah, this one, there's different people. I mean, so it follows from Hart and myself, but also I think uh, maybe Gautero and Mateus or something that was before. There, there were some people studying the, the relatively hyperbolic case. 
then definitely there's a mapping class group. And here, for instance, we can take the curve complex. So this one originally, for, for not for the action on the curve complex, but on for the action on Teichmuller space. So here's one case where you have two interesting actions where you can look at the action on the curve complex or action on a Teichmuller space. And in both cases, the, the, the boundary is a model for the Poisson boundary. And this is not contradicting anything because somehow the difference between the two boundaries is a set which is very small from the point of view of measure. Yeah. So for instance, this, this, uh, there was Kaimanovich and Mazur, for instance, in this setting with the boundary of Teichmuller space. Uh, then, of course, uh, we, we have out of n. And then here, for instance, we can take the free factor complex. And this uh, the first uh, is due to Camille with the outer space instead of this. And then, yeah, so, so for instance, the, if you look at the older paper of Joseph and myself, we do indeed also prove this under the stronger conditions, but then you need this. Um, yeah, you need this stronger condition and you, you need this WPD, but here we, we remove it. Yeah. And for instance, okay, if G is irreducible rag, then X can be the contact graph. And okay, so this uh, also, well, if you think of uh, X as acting on its Salvetti complex, that then would be a, um, then, then, then we would have the boundary with zero cube complex. So that's uh, also, so, so there are different other people. So for instance, Nevo and Sajiv or here, or, but in fact, you look at it even earlier, you will look at Carlson and Margulis already deals with cat zero spaces. So anyways, okay, anyways, so there's lots of applications. So I guess I'm done for today. So tomorrow we will see some idea of the proof. Questions? No, we don't know that, that we know. So, okay. So basically nothing is known for infinite entropy measures. Very, 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 very little. Even on the free group and even on the free semi-group. So if you only assume there's no backtracking. So it's an open conjecture whether for any measure whatsoever, this is, is the boundary. So it seems like the only thing that could be, but yeah, so then you have no, no, no control. So for instance, so in a free semi-group and yeah, so with, with Forgani, we, we have some small progress in, in this direction, but still definitely not the, the, so you still need maybe not quite the entropy, we need some quantity to be finite. So otherwise uh, you have no control. Yeah. Again, if there's other techniques, well, maybe, but this has been like very old open problem. Yeah. Good, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine what else could it be. I guess that's, a, that's, that's the issue in this problem. Yeah. No, in this, uh, no, no, we don't. So in, yeah, in the, to prove, yeah, to prove the convergence, this is our proof with, with Joseph, we did this compactification and then we go, even though now there's Guzel's proof that does not use the compactification. So it's also another way, but uh, no, we, we, we assume the convergence already. So we don't care about that. But we do use a bit of this gazelle pivoting technique.
to 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 say that this uh, yeah this this random walk doesn't take too many excursions in some sense. Yeah. What uh, what what estimate? You mean the, the strip criterion or? Oh no, this uh, we don't know. I mean, now without moment condition, you don't know that this is the thing. So you don't have a good geometric properties because you don't have moments on the distance. But this is something in the group that still allows to estimate these bad paths from a measurable point of view. But we don't know what the geometry of these bad paths is. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker.